Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, hold on a sec. Uh, I'm going to get my presentation. Do you want a short uh, introduction? Yeah, of course. Yep. All right. So thanks everyone for coming to this week's uh, virtual CETA seminar. So today we are fortunate to have Dr. JJ Zanasi give a seminar on based on his research. So JJ has been here with us at CETA since 2018. Before that, uh, he got his PhD from uh, uh, Cornell University working with Professor Dong Lai. So Gigi's research is mostly on uh, uh, disk uh, dynamics. So today's uh, topic is gonna be on the uh, disks around, disks that produces tidal disrupting events. So with that, please go ahead, Gigi. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Wei, for the excellent introduction. All right, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, all right, um, let's get to presentation mode. Uh, yeah. So everyone can see this, correct? Looks good. Okay, excellent. All right, um, and then, hold on. I'm gonna try and get it to full screen really quick. Okay. All right, so thank you everyone uh, for attending this virtual seminar. My name is JJ Zanazi. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. And today, what I'm going to talk about is work I did primarily also here at the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics on the dynamics of highly eccentric and warped disks, which form soon after the tidal disruption event of a star around a supermassive black hole. Um, but I'd like to also mention that this work uh, started when I was the PhD student at Cornell University, working under Professor Dong Lai. And it was uh, also carried out briefly at the University of Cambridge when I was visiting there for a David Creighton uh, fellowship under the advice of um, under the guidance of Professor Gordon Overman. So um, today, what I'm going to start off by doing is briefly review what a tidal disruption event actually is. So when a star approaches a supermassive black hole on a highly eccentric orbit, that you can assume that it's a nearly parabolic orbit. And for this nearly parabolic orbit, when the pericenter distance of this nearly parabolic orbit has a distance less than roughly the tidal radius, of the, which is where the tidal force exerted on the star by the supermassive black hole's gravity exceeds the star's own self-gravity, the star goes ahead and tidally disrupts. And after this tidal disruption event, a rain of stellar debris then comes back down onto the supermassive black hole, which decays with a, a characteristic t to the minus 5 thirds power law and rains down at a highly super Eddington rate at early times. And this stellar debris rapidly forms an accretion disk weeks to months after the original tidal disruption event. So this is the very standard picture of TDEs. And if you take the standard picture, because the accretion rate should be highly served with Eddington early on, you expect the luminosity of this disk, which forms right after the tidal disruption events, to emit near the Eddington luminosity. And then just using um, another set of order magnitude est arguments, because these streams should rapidly absolutely process, you expect the outer radius of this disk to form at roughly twice the pericenter distance of the nearly parabolic orbit, which should be about twice the tidal radius. And then, so because we now know the luminosity, as well as the radius that we expect from this, this TDE, what we can then go ahead and do is just assuming at an order of magnitude level that this disk emits like a black body, with th which emits thermally with an outer radius of order twice the circularization radius. We can estimate the, the peak temperature which this TDE is expected to emit at. And the a number that goes ahead and pops out is about 10 to the 5 degrees Kelvin. And this is the estimate that we expect for the thermal emission from this TDE. However, there have been a number of TDEs which have been detected with temperatures that peak thermally at temperatures much, much lower than this rough crude order magnitude 10 to the 5 degrees Kelvin um, estimate. In order to explain why you have a temperature this high um, for uh, the TDE, because these TDEs typically emit near the Eddington luminosity, 
you need a much larger radius to explain this much lower temperature, which you see from these thermally emitting TDEs. All right, so looking at this argument in a little bit more detail, what we're plotting here on the x-axis is the UV and optical luminosity, while the y-axis, the x-ray luminosity, of a number of different TDE candidates. And the dot dashed line here shows where the UV and optical luminosities are equal to one another. And TDE candidates, which lie more or less above this line, can be more or less explained by the thermal emission from a compact accretion disk, which peaks primarily in the soft X-ray and ultraviolet. The points which lie more or less below this line to a significant degree, these are what you typically call um, optical TDEs. And it's really, really hard to explain these low temperature uh, thermally emitting TDEs with a compact accretion disk model. And again, to remind ourselves why it's really hard to explain these low temperature TDEs, because the compact accretion disk model implies that the peak temperature is of order 10 to the 5 degrees Kelvin, and the luminosity is of order the Eddington luminosity. In order to get the temperature for these optical TDEs so low, you need an emission area much larger than the expected outer radius um, of a compact accretion disk, which forms at, twi at the circularization radius. And so what we're going to discuss now is uh, one possible way to alleviate this discrepancy in why the real emission area for thermally emitting TDEs is so much larger than the rough estimate of twice the tidal radius, which you get for the circularization radius. And this idea which I'm going to discuss, and the first idea when we talk about the thermal emission from TDEs, is departing from this compact accretion disk model and looking at what happens when instead of the TDE circularizing efficiently, it doesn't circularize efficiently. So specifically, the model which we're going to be discussing, which was developed by Svi Peron and Julie Krolik, along them, among a lot of other collaborators, is this idea that the TDE accretion disk uh, forms. It is primarily heated due to shocks from the debris material um, intersecting one another. And because the disk does not efficiently circularize, it remains highly extended right after its formation. And assuming that the disk is heated primarily through sh shocks and remains highly extended after its formation, gives you a rough order magnitude estimate for what the effective temperature from this TDE should be. And the rough crude order magnitude estimate you get is about 10 to the 4 degrees Kelvin, which pops out from a few simple order magnitude estimates. So this is the first idea which I'm going to be discussing today, which is going to motivate my, the, the work that I did um, here at CETA on eccentric and warp TDE disks. The second motivation for the work which I did here at CETA is the non-thermal emission you see from a number of tidal disruption events. So specifically, there have been a number of TDEs which have been detected now whose spectrum lot is nowhere close to thermal. And the best explanation for why the spectra of these TDEs is nowhere close to normal, to, sorry, thermal, is that the emission it comes is primarily due to a highly relativistic jet which is launched near the inner edge of the tidal disruption events accretion disk. And the TDE, which, we're going, which is going to highly motivate the second part of this talk, is this famous TDE, SWIFT 1644 plus 57. And the reason why this TDE, the, which is the first one, um, is particularly interesting for the second part of today's talk is because it has hard X-ray um, emission, which exhibits quasi-periodic oscillations with a period of around three days. And so um, it turns out one possible way in which you can get a TDE disk to exhibit quasi-periodic oscillations with a period of around three days in the hard X-ray is due to relativistic lens throwing precession. And what this model argues is the reason why we're seeing these quasi-periodic oscillations is because the jet is tightly coupled to the inner edge of the TDE's accretion disk, as the TDE disk goes ahead and processes around the spin axis of the supermassive black hole, the jet goes in and out of the observer's line of sight. And every time the jet passes into the observer's line of sight, you get a blast of hard X-ray emission. When it goes out of the line of sight, you get a dip in the hard X-ray emission. And so in today's talk, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to look at the dynamics of highly eccentric and warped accretion disks, which deviate significantly from the standard paradigm of a compact flat accretion disk. And the reason why we're going to go ahead and do this is we want to understand first the near and 
UV and optical thermal emission from a highly, which we expect from a highly eccentric disk. And second, we want to understand what we'd expect from quasi-periodic oscillations from lens during precession for a disk which forms misaligned with respect to the equatorial uh, black hole, with respect to the spinning supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, which is driven, uh, which is going to work. Okay, so part one, what we're going to go ahead and do first is we're going to look at the dynamics of a highly eccentric accretion disk. And to look at the dynamics of one of these highly eccentric accretion disks, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to use the secular adiabatic nonlinear eccentric disk theory, which was developed by Goran Ogilvy and his student Elliot Lynch um, last year. And we're going to use this formalism to calculate realistic, highly eccentric TDE disk solutions for a reasonable model for a TDE disk. And after we use this secular formalism to calculate realistic TDE disk models, what we're then going to go ahead and do is we're going to calculate the thermal emission, which we'd expect from this highly eccentric TDE disk. And so specifically looking at the nonlinear eccentric disk eigenmodes, which we're going to go ahead and calculate for this theory. Uh, what we're going to do um, is, we're, is the special class of solutions we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to calculate uh, this class of solutions where the pericenter direction of all of the eccentric fluid annuli point in the same direction. So the formalism that was developed by Gordon Ogilvy and Elliot Lynch, along a number of others, this formalism uh, assumes that, pressure, that eccentric disturbances within an accretion disk uh, propagate uh, via pressure through pressure forces. And th this formalism assumes that the eccentric disk annuli within the disk itself form a nested sequence of ellipses throughout the disk. And they communicate with one another through pressure. And these special solutions, which we're going to go ahead and ca calculate, are pretty strange. And the reason why they're strange is if you go ahead and you form a disk, which is highly eccentric, and you just set it around uh, some sort of central mass, pressure forces within this disk are going to cause the disk itself to rapidly apsidal, apsidally process and work to change the direction the pericenter directions are all pointing within this disk. But in, if in addition of just having the disk be highly eccentric, the disk itself is also processing at a constant frequency, it turns out there are special precession frequencies where the disk is completely rigidly processing, where the inertial force exerted on the fluid annuli can balance all of the influences on the eccentric fluid annuli, which work to rapidly twist the disk itself and change the direction, the pericenter directions of all these eccentric fluid annuli are pointing. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to calculate the structure of these highly eccentric solutions, as well as calculate the precession frequencies which these highly eccentric disks are processing at to understand the dynamics of these highly eccentric disks. And the model which we're going to set as the background for calculating these highly eccentric uh, solutions is shown here, the main assumptions. And so one of the key assumptions which we're going to assume for this work is after a single orbital period of the stellar debris after it, the tidal disruption event of the star, the fallback debris of the stellar material loses some fraction of its binding energy. And this effect causes the semi-major axis of the stellar debris to go ahead and move inward. And this, what if this effect goes ahead and does is it works to heat the disk material because what we're going to go ahead and do is we are going to assume this binding energy which is lost for the orbital binding energy of the debris is then put into the internal energy within the disk and this material working to heat the disk is going to drive the thermal emission, which we go ahead and see for these highly eccentric disk solutions. And the assumptions we're going to go ahead and use for the surface density for this highly eccentric accretion disk is that as we, we assume that the, the uh, stellar debris accretes at the characteristic t to the minus 5 thirds uh, power law, which you expect for the stellar debris to reaccrete on the TDE disk, and to calculate how the surface density evolves, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to integrate throughout the annular extent of the disk with time to figure out how the surface density of this disk goes ahead and evolves. So we're going to assume some very simple but reasonable assumptions about what the uh, TDE disk, the backline, the underlying uh, surface density and temperature profiles for this disk go ahead and look like. And here are the results for our highly eccentric TDE disk solutions. So the different curves here um, show different boundary conditions at the highly eccentric disk's inner edge. And we go ahead and do is we change the single parameter, which we denote by lambda e, which is a fudge factor which reduces the inner disk's eccentricity 
by a dimensionless constant from what you'd get just from angular momentum conservation. And the key result to keep in mind from these calculations is that all these calculations find that the apsidal precession rate for this highly eccentric disk lies at a frequency which is lower than the orbital frequency at the inner edge of the TDE disk. And within all these calculations, we include the twisting force as well from general relativistic tidal precession. And so the key takeaway from this part is that coherent, highly eccentric, and slowly processing TD, uh, solutions exist for a reasonable TDE disk model. And so it's not crazy to think that these, that these TDE disks uh, form highly eccentric and remain coherent and highly eccentric after their formation. The second part of the work, which I did, was I calculated the, how the highly eccentric disk material itself goes ahead and compresses and expands, and how this adiabatic compression and expansion works to both heat and cool the disk of a highly eccentric disk. And to calculate the structure of this TDE disk, what we're going to assume that is that this disk is dominated by radiation pressure, and that energy transport within this disk occurs primarily through radiative diffusion. And so the assumption that the, that the temp internal temperature of the disk is transported primarily through radiative diffusion is going to allow us to, ca to calculate a simple estimate for the effective temperature of the disk. And once we calculate the simple estimate for the disk effective temperature, we can then calculate the spectral energy distribution of the disk, or SED, um, by assuming that the disk itself emits everywhere locally like a black body with the temperature equal to the effective temperature within the disk. And so before we get into the thermal emission from our more detailed TDE disk solutions, what I'm going to show are more, a much simpler model for a highly eccentric TDE disk, where the disk itself has just a single constant eccentricity throughout the annular extent of the disk itself. And so we see from these solutions when the disk eccentricity is really low, thermal emission peaks primarily in the optical and near ultraviolets. Well, when the disk eccentricity is high, it peaks primarily in the soft X-ray and far UV. And the key takeaway from this part is that in order to explain the low effective temperatures of TDE disks, the disk actually can't be too eccentric because if it's coherently eccentric to, uh, uh, um, if it has a very high eccentricity and it is, uh, has the same eccentricity throughout the entire disk, it will peak not in the near UV and optical, but rather far UV um, and soft X-ray. And these are not the properties which we see for the uh, optical TDEs, which we see. And it, so that, that was the simple disk model, which I'm, what I'm now showing are the more detailed calculations for the SEDs for our more realistic solutions. And although the results differ quantitatively from the simple uh, solutions just showed before, the same qualitative trends still occur. Primarily when the disk eccentricity is really low, the disk is bright primarily in the ultraviolet and optical. Well, when the disk eccentricity is high, the disk is bright primarily in the soft X-ray and far UV. Okay, so now when we go ahead and we compare with observations, again, to remind ourselves what this plot is actually showing, the X-axis shows the UV and optical luminosity of a number of TDE disk candidates. Well, the y-axis shows the x-ray uh, emission from a number of TDE disk candidates. Well, the dashed line here shows where the two luminosities are equal to one another. Um, and again, as a reminder, the points which can't be described by the compact accretion disk model are these points right here, which lie below this line. So these points show the primary results from our highly eccentric TDE disk model. And we can see that although they tend to overpredict the luminosities of a number of optical TDE disk candidates, at the order of magnitude level, they describe the uh, X-ray and UV and optical emission from these TDEs actually pretty well. And briefly going over the main co correlations we see for all of these different TDE disk candidates, when you increase the eccentricity of the disk, what this primarily works to go ahead and do is increase the X-ray luminosity of a number of TDE disk candidates. If you increase the annular extent of the disk, because disk further aw away from the supermassive black hole is cooler than disk closer to the supermassive black hole, this works to cool the disk. While if you increase the mass of the supermassive black hole, because the disk itself is primarily supported through radiation pressure, this works to increase the bolometric luminosity of the disk's emission. 
Okay, so takeaways from the first part of the talk. It's very reasonable to expect a TDE disk to form highly eccentric and slowly processing. Um, and when you, the second part of the, this uh, first part of the talk is that it is very reasonable to expect these highly eccentric TDE disks to emit thermal emission, which peaks primarily in the near UV. But in order for the, disk, the eccentric extended disk to peak primarily um, in the soft X-ray, uh, to not peak primarily in the soft X-ray, the disk actually cannot be too eccentric because apocenter compression, which works to heat disk material, drives up the thermal emission uh, and significantly increases the disk that's affected temperature. Uh, JJ? Uh, yeah, quick, what's up? Quick question for Chris. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. So, so how does the radius of the disrupted star fit in all, into all this? Because it, it shouldn't be the same from event to event. There could be giant, yeah. there could be dwarfs being disrupted. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it mainly, so the main thing which the radius fits in um, is the tidal radius. So that the tidal radius depends sensitively on the radius of the host star. And this affects the scaling of a number of different quantities. So uh, that because everything scales with the radius of the host star with the tidal radius, mm -hmm. um, the radius of the star itself uh, shows up um, in this highly idealized simple model um, in a number of different places. Um, and because the radius is correlated with the mass of the host star itself as well, um, this, this means that the mass of the star does affect uh, the emission which you see from these TDE disks. Yeah, but I, I was asking the question specifically in the context of the relative amounts of UV versus X-ray. Oh, um, yeah, so I don't actually know um, off the top of my head uh, how that affects things. I believe because it increases the tidal radius, that means that this should, uh, increasing the mass of the host star as well as the radius, the primary effect of this would be to decrease the effect of temperature of the disk because it becomes more extended. But I have to check the, the model itself to be 100% sure if that, if that answers your question. Uh, did that answer your question, Chris? Or? Uh, well, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. okay, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, thanks so, for the question. JJ, I'm also confused. So, okay. yeah, um, so you say when it's for given disk, you're saying if the eccentricity is higher, the UV is going to be bright, sorry, X ray is going to be brighter because the pericenter compression, is that right? Yep, yeah, exactly. Um, so the compression is sort of released instantaneously. What's the thermal time scale? Oh yeah, so it turns out the rate of diffusion time scale is comparable to the lifetime of these disks. So that's, so in our assumption, so, so in this model, what we're primarily interested in doing is calculating the peak X-ray and optical luminosities for these TDE disks. So we assume that right after the formation of this, the stuff that goes ahead and heats the disk is contained within the disk and nothing goes ahead um, and escapes. And so near pericenter, um, we completely ignored the radiation being able to escape um, near pericenter due to this pericenter compression. And that actually might uh, be a, a assumption which goes ahead and breaks down, uh, which can work to cool the disk over a very rapid time scale. But we're primarily in this work interested in the thermal emission right when the disk goes ahead and forms. So for this simple order of magnitude estimate, we're completely ignoring the effects of thermal diffusion. Um. Uh, does that answer your question, Yanshin, or? Um, so you just take the, you just assume the heating is, uh, the material heats up to the black body instantaneously, you observe the black body. Yeah, that's exactly right, yep. Okay, yep. right, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, so it's it's extremely highly idealized, uh, but at the order of magnitude level, it seems to describe the thermal emission from a number of TDE candidates, which is encouraging. Okay, so now the second part of the talk, motivated by the hard X-ray emission of a number of TDEs, where you see quasi-periodic oscillations. What I'm going to discuss next is what happens when you form a TDE disk, which has a plane misaligned with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, which is spinning. 
And specifically, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to use the bending weight formalism, which is developed by Gordon Ogilvy and Stephen Lubo in 1999 and 2000. And with this formalism, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to calculate the precession rate of the disk or in the supermassive black hole. We're also going to calculate the alignment rate of the disk with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane. And we're going to calculate this alignment rate due to two different influences, viscosity and fallback material exerting a torque on the disk. And last, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to calculate the disk's tilt profile, um, which is going to work to uh, significantly warp the disk. OK, so the disk model, which we go ahead um, and use as a background for the stuff which we're going to go ahead and calculate, is shown here. So uh, what we do is we, so the assumptions for the simple disk model is the orbital plane of the disk itself has a teeny tiny tilt with respect to the spin axis of the spinning supermassive black holes. And in order to calculate how this disk goes ahead and dynamically evolves, what we're going to do is we're going to project the, uh, the um, orbital angular momentum unit vector of the disk onto the xy plane of the equatorial plane of the spinning supermassive black hole. Or what we're interested in calculating is the warp profile, which we're going to note by beta tilde, um, as well as the precession frequency, which is going to be the precession frequency of the disk spinning around the supermassive black hole, which is known by omega, as well as the damping rate of the disk with respect to the supermassive black hole, which we're going to note by gamma. And it turns out the twist doesn't turn out to be very important. So in this talk, we're not going to discuss the twist phi tilde that much. And in order to calculate how this disk goes ahead and evolves, what we're going to do is we're going to use post-Newtonian expressions for how a disk, um, which is misaligned with respect to an equatorial, the or equatorial plane of supermassive black holes, nodally processes as well as absolutely processes. And these assumptions are going to allow us to calculate the properties of a warped disk processing around the supermassive black hole. And so um, what we're going to go ahead and do, um, so before we calculate the warp structure of the disk, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to use bending, uh, we're going to use WKB theory to calculate our expectations for what the warp within the disk should go ahead and look like. And when you go ahead and use WKB, B, WKB theory to look at how the disk goes ahead um, and evolves and our expectations for the structure near the inner edge of the disk. Because bending waves, which is the main way which warps are propagated in a TDE disk, um, you can calculate the, the, the radio wave number of the bending wave to be the apsidal, sorry, the nodal precession frequency, which we're going to note by omega hole, multiplied by this quantity kappa tilde, multiplied by the orbital frequency omega which is related to the apsidal precession frequency of an eccentric uh, test particle near the inner edge of the supermassive black hole. Both of these quantities are divided by the sound speed to the second power. And so at the qualitative level, when you form a TDE disk, which is spinning retrograde with respect to the spin of the supermassive black hole, the warp propagates in an evanescent manner, which means that we expect that the warp to be very smooth near the inner edge of a black hole accretion disk. But if um, the disk forms prograde with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, um, because both of these frequencies are positive, this means that our expectation for the warp should be that the warp should propagate or be highly oscillatory near the inner edge of the black hole. And the important thing to note here is that although we are primarily focused on warps, which depends, which naively you think that it only is sensitive to the nodal precession frequency, the apsidal precession frequency can qualitatively influence the dynamics of a uh, accretion disk which forms around a supermassive black hole. And so shown here are our warp profile results for a disk which is spinning prograde with respect to the supermassive black hole spin. And we can see here, um, like we expected from our simple WKB estimates, as you get near the inner edge of the TDE disk, the warp becomes highly oscillatory. And this result was actually reproduced by a number of other works, which also found that when you look at the tilt profile near the TDE disk's inner edge, the disk becomes highly oscillatory. So this is actually very, very not new. Um, it's been reproduced in a number of different works. Hey, oh, you, oh, yeah, what's up? Yeah, what's yeah. up, Hamza? Yeah. Uh, small question. So uh, about your previous equations, so this is really interesting. Uh, you had... Um, uh, a kappa, which um, you yeah, which defines I think the uh, the way the W propagates. Yep, so, yep, yep. Is, so did I understand correctly that 
in this prograde mode, it just dies out over distance? Um, yes, yes, that's correct. So simple order of magnitude estimates. Um, if you have a disk which forms retrograde with respect to the supermassive black hole, um, if you, let's see here, yeah, if you have, yes, yeah, so I have, I have the X here. So this is what happens when you have a disk which is spinning in the opposite direction as the black hole. The warp itself becomes evanescent, um, and as you approach the disk center edge, the tilt at the inner edge is smaller than the tilt at the outer edge. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like you said, the warp dies out and is highly evanescent. <laughs> but if, oh, yeah, yeah did, did that answer your question, Hamza? Or? Great, okay. thank you so much. Okay, yeah, thank you, Hamza. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay, um, yeah, so um, what's the interesting thing that uh, Dong and I went ahead and found for this work, though, is that we, found, uh, that we find that when a disk forms prograde with respect to the spinning black hole, the tilt itself becomes highly oscillatory no matter what regime you lie in, whether it's the diffusive or resonant regime. So this is a bit of a technical detail. So diffusive, the diffusive regime is when you have a disk disturbance, which, which a bending wave disturbance, which dies out locally. It can't propagate globally across the disk. Well, in the resonant regime, you have what this means is that the warp disk can propagate bedding wave disturbances globally. Um, and previous works argued that when you have a TDE disk, which forms in the diffusive regime, the disk is never highly oscillatory. It's evanescent with an inner edge, which is more aligned with respect to the equatorial plane of the supermassive black hole than the outer edge. But we're, what we're finding in this work um, is that the reason why the other works found this is they didn't include the important effect of apocytal precession when you get close to the inner edge of the TDE disk. And like Hamza mentioned, when you have a retrograde spinning uh, disk with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, the, um, the tilt profile near the inner edge of the disk is more aligned with the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane than the outer edge. Um, and uh, takeaway from this part is that it, people are beginning to expect that retrograde disks may actually be more common than prograde disks. And they may actually explain the quasi-periodic oscillations we see in a number of different TDE candidates better. And the reason why um, is because in order to get this lens theoring um, uh, precession to explain QPOs, you need a very small tilt with respect uh, to, uh, with, of the disk with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane. And this will help reduce the tilts. Okay, so this is the first part of the talk, looking at the tilt profile of the disk. Now what we're gonna go ahead um, and do is figure out how the disk goes ahead and evolves with precession frequency and damping rate. What we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna look at how the TDE disk um, evolves as it's driven to nodal precession due, due to lens ther theory effect. And we're first going to focus only on dissipation due to viscosity, which works to align the disk um, orbital plane with the supermassive black hole spin axis. We're going to look at what happens um, as the disk cools as the accretion rate falls. And so specifically, what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to use a disk model which was really pioneered by Linda Strub and Elliot Quartet in 2009. Um, and although um, uh, Linda was not uh, here when she did this particular work, she was a later uh, citizen. Um, and this work is really, really influential in the field. And also a work which was very relevant to this is the work of Shen and Matzner. And of course, we all know uh, Chris Matzner and Shen was also a citizen here. Um, and uh, so Shen and Matzner did a much more uh, detailed model of what the thermal structure of a TDE disk should go, should, should go ahead and look like. We're going to assume a much more idealized model than the uh, thermal model used by Shen and Matzner, where we assume that the disk is only heated by viscosity and is supported primarily through radiation pressure. And the two things which work to go ahead and cool the disk are advection, which is just material passing within the disk, as well as radiation, which is just photons escaping the disk. And the different lines here show the thermal state of the disk for different accretion rates. And the key takeaway here is that the higher your accretion rate is, the more your disk is viscously heated, um, and the hotter your disk is, while the lower the accretion rate, the lower your viscous heating is, and the colder you expect your TDE disk to go ahead and be. Okay, so that are, is our expectations for the TDE um, disk model. What we're gonna go ahead um, and do now is we're going to look at how 
the precession frequency and damping rates go ahead and evolve as the disc lowers its accretion rate. So at early times, the accretion rate is really, really high. Um, and when the accretion rate is really, really high, what's, what we have here in the green line is the precession frequency of the disc around the supermassive black hole. Well, the magenta lines show the damping rate of the disc, um, of the disc, uh, uh, the disc plane with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane. And we see when the accretion rate is very, very high, the precession rate of the disc is really, really close to the lens thering rigid body precession frequency, which describes a how a completely flat uh, disc, which is completely rigid, processes around the spin axis of a supermassive black hole. And the key takeaway from here is during this high, high accretion rate regime, the precession frequency of the disk is much, much higher than the damping rate of the disk with respect to the supermassive black hole's uh, spin axis. And as the disk accretion rate is lowered, what happens is when you get to a very low accretion rate, instead of the lens thering precession, uh, the, the precession frequency being really close to the rigid body lens thering precession frequency, it becomes very, very highly variable. And the damping rate becomes comparable to the precession rate of the disk around the supermassive black hole's spin vector. So I don't have the time to discuss the details of why you enter in this highly variable um, state, but I can guarantee you it's a real effect. Um, and Dong and I worked out uh, a toy model which, which went over the physics of why this goes ahead and takes place. Well, the key takeaway is that when the disk enters this regime, you're basically guaranteed to not have rigid body lens thering precession. You're not going to see um, uh, coherent quasi-periodic oscillations emitted by a TDE accretion disk. And a really speculative uh, uh, thing to say about this regime is that it might be possible for the disk to actually go ahead and break when you get to accretion rates this low. Um, but because I'm using only linear theory to look at the dynamics of the TDE disk, I'm not going to comment about disk breaking a whole lot more. Okay. And so the last thing I looked at in the second part of this talk is the dynamical effect of the stellar debris, which goes ahead and re-accretes um, material onto the supermassive black hole, which exerts a torque on the outer edge of the TDE disk. And the main dynamical effect of this torque is to damp any precession, which was originally excited by the disk forming misaligned with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane. Um, and it causes the disk to relax to a steady state profile where the outer edge of the disk is misaligned with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, while the inner edge of the disk is more or less aligned with respect to um, the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane. And so um, when we look at the, evolution, at the disk evolution, including the dynamical effect of the fallback torque, the results of this um, is shown in this figure. Um, so the cyan lines up on top show the dynamical effect of the full. Oh, so uh, yeah, yeah. And so the cyan lines show the dynamical effect of the fallback material, which works to damp the disk to its steady state profile. Well, the magenta lines on bottom on the bottom show the dynamical effect of viscosity. And we see that because the fallback rate typically exceeds the precession frequency of the disk around the spinning supermassive black hole. If you include the effect of the fallback material, you actually expect to see no coherent uh, precession due to the lens throwing uh, frame dragging effect of the disk around the supermassive black hole spin vector. And this actually was something which was reproduced by the study done by Pavel Ivanov and a number of other collaborators, which was re released a little bit before we uh, published this work. Okay, so the key takeaways from the second part of the work is that prograde TDE disks always have oscillatory warp profiles, while retrograde TDE disks have highly evanescent warp profiles. And uh, explain, in order to explain the quasi-periodic oscillations you see in a number of TDE disk candidates, um, it may be more reasonable to uh, use a retrograde disk model. Um, in addition, when the accretion rate of the disk is really high, uh, the precession frequency is approximately equal to the lens thering uh, precession frequency of a rigid disk around a spinning supermassive black hole. While at low um, accretion rates, because the precession frequency becomes highly variable, you don't expect the disk in the slow accretion rate regime to show any sort of coherent lens during precession. But this is only um, including the effect of viscosity. If you include the effect, 
of the fallback material working to align, uh, damp the disk precession to its steady state profile. Because the effect of the fallback material is so strong at early times, this coherent precession is completely washed out um, near, um, um, at early times because of the fallback torque. You don't actually expect to see any coherent precession at all, including the damping effect of the fallback torque. So thank you very much for allowing me to present here at, the, uh, at CETA to give a CETA seminar. And I'll take any questions if anyone has any. So thank you again for letting me speak. Yeah, thanks, JJ, for the talk. And uh, we, ha we have had a, a few questions during the talk. Any more questions? Well, can I just ask, so you're, you're interested in explaining possible precession in a jet source. Yes. And so the jet will be sensitive to the disk, the very innermost parts of the disk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and, so. And so I'm, I'm a little confused. In the very innermost parts of the disk, why aren't you um, nearly aligned most of the time. I'm, I'm missing this. So it depends on uh, whether the disk is prograde is orbiting in the same direction. So if the disk material itself is orbiting in the same direction as the black hole spinning, yeah. or if it's orbiting in the opposite direction. Um, and uh, what happens if you have stuff orbiting in the same direction, the disk tilts due to a combination of nodal precession due to once during frame dragging, um, as well as apsidal precession uh, due yeah. to uh, yeah. Yeah, other general relativistic effects. The combination of these things is going to cause the disk tilt to be lower at the inner edge than the outer edge. Um, but in the opposite regime, because just looking at how bending waves propagate uh, through uh, warp disks, the disturbance becomes highly oscillatory rather than ever as an essence. The disturbance, um, instead of becoming, uh, the, the warp instead of becoming evanescent, it becomes highly uh, oscillatory. And so um, in this opposite regime, you expect uh, the, the disk to actually be more misaligned at the inner edge than at the outer edge. And so this will have a significant impact on the jet if it remains coupled to the inner edge of the accretion disk when it enters this highly oscillatory uh, work profile. Um, is, is this seen in, in hydrodynamic simulations that you can maintain a very strong tilt near the, in, in the innermost few gravitational radii? Yeah, 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 it absolutely is. So I, I unfortunately didn't have time to discuss this, but there have been a number of really excellent simulations done by Wieska et al., along with uh, uh, Sasha Tchaikovsky, yeah. um, where they look at when you have a disk in uh, what they call the, the resonant bending wave regime, when the alpha viscosity is smaller than the scale height of the TDE disk. Mm -hmm. And what these nonlinear simulations show is when the disk is highly tilted with respect to the supermassive black hole's equatorial plane, the disk becomes highly oscillatory near the disk center edge. Um, in addition, when you look, do simulations looking at how the jet is coupled to the disk center edge, it remains highly coupled to the disk center edge when it enters this highly oscillatory state. And so is it realistic to expect a very low viscosity near the inner edge? So if you uh, look at simulations of uh, uh, just MHD simulations of uh, really we're here with a huge accretion rate. That's the thing that's yeah. puzzling me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, just from um, yeah, so just from MRI, uh, you, there have been a few um, simulations which have shown the alpha parameter you expect for a really, really thick torus similar to a TDE. Um, the alpha values you typically expect are anywhere between 0.1 and 0.01. So around 10% to 1% is the alpha mm -hmm. values. And for these TDE disks, um, especially at early times when the disk is really thick, um, the, eight, the aspect ratio of the disk is of order unity. So it's uh, H over R is of order one. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, especially at early times um, and a little bit more so at late times, you expect the disk to remain in the slow viscosity resonant regime over the course of most of its evolution. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Chris. JJ, quick question. Um, yeah. When you have the fallback interacting with the outer edge of your disk, are you certain that it will 
always interact at the outer edge. I remember worrying in 2014 about the possibility of the fallback stream missing the outer edge because the disk had processed away. Yep, yeah, yeah. No, that's an excellent question. And I, yeah, I remember that about um, the work that you did with Shen. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what, like you found in your work, it, if the disk becomes really, really tilted, it might be possible for the material to go ahead um, and miss the outer edge and instead hit somewhere in the middle of the disk. Um, and so we actually went ahead and looked at that. We didn't publish that part, but if you include that effect, if the material is deposited somewhere in the middle of the disk, rather than the outside of the disk, it really, it does um, decrease the fallback rate, but it decreases it by like a factor of two or three. And so you still get the fallback rate to be much higher than the precession frequency of the disk, um, even if the fallback uh, material only deposits its angular momentum somewhere um, in the middle of the disk rather than the outer edge. Yeah. So thank you, Chris. Yeah. And uh, just to follow up, you don't, you're don't um, you pessimistic on the possibility of disk winds in these radiation-supported uh, advective disks. So let's see here. Um, and when you, when you speak about disk winds, do you mean uh, the ability of disk winds to transport angular momentum? or yes angular okay. momentum and some of the infall that the disk is processing yeah yeah so we don't yeah so we don't go ahead um, and include the effect of uh, disk winds um, anywhere in our work but yeah so i guess the main effect of that would be to change the uh, accretion rate for so for our work we, we don't actually include the effect of viscous spreading at all so we, we just assume for the, the second part where we just look at a warp disk we assume that the outer edge of the TDE disk always just stays at uh, twice the tidal radius um, of the disk around the supermassive black hole. Um, and so because it just stays fixed, the, the main effect I think disk winds would uh, go ahead and do um, is it change the accretion rate of material throughout the disk. And you can just rescale all the results of this work um, with the accretion rate um, and figure out if you include disk winds and the viscous heating rate isn't quite as high how this goes ahead and changes the thermal structure within the disk. Uh, does that... Well, that we found uh, uh, one of our conclusions, and I'm trying to figure out what's the difference in assumption. Yeah. One of our conclusions was that the disk would spread and that disk winds would be helpful in maintaining a compact disk in the presence of feedback and hmm. in the presence of fallback. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's obviously a difference in, um, in the basic model somewhere. Oh, no, 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 there's a huge difference. Yeah, my, yeah, so it's a, you're, you um, did a much more detailed uh, study of the disk itself um, and all the different effects that can happen within the disk. So for my disk model, I didn't have time to discuss it in a tremendous amount of detail, but what we assume here is that the disk just stays totally fixed. So in your, uh, in your paper, you did really nice uh, self-similar calculations of how disk winds, um, and viscous heating and advective cooling and radiation. Um, and uh, you took into full account uh, the disk not being completely supported by radiation pressure, also by gas pressure, um, all these different things. Um, there is really, really nice work. Um, so in comparison, my background disk model is way more, uh, uh, leaves out a lot more uh, physics than you included um, in your model. So in my model, all I'm doing is assuming the disk itself has an outer radius, which is just twice the tidal radius, and that just stays fixed um, and doesn't evolve with time. Um, as well as the only thing that goes ahead and heats the disk is viscosity, um, and the only thing that cools the disk is advection and radiation. We assume really simple expressions for both of these. Um, and uh, we just change uh, the accretion rate by a single parameter. Um, and so we don't, we, we uh, uh, and we just assume a steady state profile of the disk. So um, in comparison, yeah, so we leave out a lot of ingredients, which are which turn out to be, uh, which you showed are very important, especially at the late times of the TDE disk, um, which may significantly alter our results. Um, but we want it, because the understanding the warp profile of the disk itself turned out to be a lot more complicated than we expected, we wanted to have the simplest possible uh, underlying back model that included the primary physics for how this thing goes ahead and evolves. Yeah, it seems like obviously an important ingredient. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. No, there, there absolutely could be a lot better further work on how the thermal structure of the disk itself affects the warp profile. 
Um, but uh, we wanted to do the simplest um, thing first be in order to understand how the warp goes ahead and evolves. Um, but no, there's absolutely a lot more work for um, future uh, projects. So, yeah. Uh, JJ, maybe just a final uh, quick question. Um, yeah, what's up? This is about your one of the figures you showed, I think, mm -hmm. the, towards the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but if I did, um, uh, you had the standard um, t to the minus five by three uh, fall off mm -hmm. uh, would get. Uh, did you say that it would get modified by this effect, and therefore the um, it wouldn't look like um, that kind of fall off anymore? Uh, this would be very relevant because a lot of people yeah, yeah, yeah. are. Um, asking whether uh, the candidate TDs are really TDs at all and uh, you know whether um, uh, it would be great if we can do a better classification. So is that important uh, from yeah, yeah. what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, absolutely, you're absolutely right. That a number of different works of recently have drawn into question the, the characteristic T to the minus five thirds power law. And also, if you look at a number of different observed TDEs, um, they all don't, they, they typically, uh, so you, what you do is you go ahead and track the bolometric luminosity of the TDE, and you just fit it with some power law, T to some power, and the power law that they find for a lot of TDEs uh, doesn't match to the T to the minus five thirds power law, which you'd expect um, from re accretion of material onto the TDE disk. So um, everywhere throughout my work, um, so I assume just a t to the minus uh, five thirds uh, power law everywhere um, here. So I don't have anything uh, to add on that really interesting part of the debate in TDE physics. Um, but modifying the t to the minus five thirds uh, power law will have an impact on the underlying disk model for the eccentric disk, as well as how the warp disk goes ahead um, and evolves as uh, since we assume everywhere that the accretion rate within the disk matches the accretion rate of stellar debris onto material when it hits the outer disk. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah. So the T to the minus five thirds power law will have an impact on all the results that um, I discussed today. Yeah, so thank you very much for uh, your question. Did I answer your question, Hamsa? Yeah, this is great, thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you. Do we have more questions for JJ? Well, if not, maybe we could uh, thank JJ again and uh, hope to see you next time, next week. Yep. yep. All right. Thanks, yep. JJ, for the talk. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Have a great day.